All right, everybody. Uh, again, sorry you can't see my head today, but I, I hope my hands will be animated enough that you can imagine what's happening on my face. So we're going to start out today talking about the experimental and data presentation style passages. There's a couple of big things I need you to know to start out with. First of all, they're the second most common style of passage. The other styles, remember, are the situation style passage or the persuasive style passage. So experimental is right there in the middle. But we're going to spend a lot of time on it today because these are the most common crossover passages. Now, what does crossover mean? Uh, Billy, what do you think crossover means? Okay, Billy says that crossover means it applies to other sections like biology, organic chemistry, general chemistry, and I totally agree. With this style of passage, you're going to be asked to interpret, so you're going to have to interpret a graph or table of data, and you're going to have to draw conclusions from it, make predictions based on it, and answer questions from the data. So all of the other parts of the exam might require you to do that. So if you really hone your skills here in physics, then you'll be helping yourself any other time data comes up on the exam. Now while we're talking about passages, I've got a diagram over here on the far right hand side of my board, and we're going to use this schematic, this grid, for all of the passages that we do together. Because we want to constantly be thinking about where do the questions that we do fall within this grid. So there's an x-axis and a y-axis. The x-axis goes from recall on the left side to passage-based data on the right. It goes from synthesize the information at the top to do a procedure or follow an equation on the bottom. And then we've got memory questions, explicit questions, and implicit questions. For the questions that we find with experimental and data presentation style passages, where do you all think that those questions might fall on this grid? Um, just by a show of hands, raise your hand if you think it might be on the memory recall side. Okay, I'm not seeing many hands. Raise your hand if you think it'd be in the synthesized kind of abstract area. Not seeing many hands, so I guess you're all in agreement that it's going to be in the procedure-based explicit side. And I totally agree. So that's going to make these questions, for many of you, they're very concrete and to the point. When you get good at this, for many of you, these might be the easier questions. Now everybody has a different order of difficulty, but for some of you, these more explicit, concrete style questions are going to be a little bit easier. Now, now that we've talked about the passage, let's focus in a little bit more on your highlighting. Um, the highlighting tool is a really important one for you all as you are as you're working these passages because you want to build a really strong map for yourself. Now a map is a tool that you can use to go between the questions and passage and very quickly figure out where the answers lie. Now for experimental things the the answers are going to be in tables, they're going to be in graphs, but there's going to be supplemental information inside the paragraphs that surround that data. So what kind of things we want to highlight? We can't highlight everything. We want to be very purposeful and very strategic about what we type or what we highlight. Well, one thing we might want to highlight is the purpose. For example, why was that experiment done? Now, sometimes they will tell you why it was done. Sometimes they'll kind of leave the hypothesis out. And if they do leave the hypothesis out, it would behoove you to try to figure it out on your own. Now, why do you think you'd want to do that? What do you think, Sarah? Okay, so Sarah says, if we know what the hypothesis is ourselves, we'll be less likely to get tricked by the exam. And I totally agree. 
So if they tell us the purpose of an experiment, we want to be sure to highlight it. Another thing that we want to highlight are things that are in italics. Italics, italicized words, are going to be important nouns or new new vocabulary words that maybe uh, you, you, you're unfamiliar with. And if you're unfamiliar with them, the italicized word probably is going to be followed by a definition explaining what that italicized word means. So if they give you a definition for an italicized word, you want to be sure to highlight it. So if they mention an apparatus, for example, you know where to find the name of that apparatus, and you also know where to find the definition of what that apparatus is. A third thing that would be important to highlight as you're building your map are examples of what we call floating numbers. Now that doesn't mean that they're hovering over the page. What, what, what do you think I mean by floating numbers? Bobby, what do you think? Okay, so Bobby says floating numbers are just numbers embedded within the text. And that's exactly right. So those numbers could be used to solve equations, for example. They could be um, actually floating numbers of data if they didn't use a table or a graph. So any kind of floating numbers, we want to be aware of them and we want to, we want to highlight them. A fourth thing that would be important to highlight are what we call causal statements. And causal words are words like therefore or because. So those statements that are preceded by their or following therefore and because tell us why something happens. It's a causal statement. That could be important to highlight when you're building your map. Another thing that uh, you want to be aware of and to highlight are examples of what we call extreme language. Extreme language. An extreme language would be like all or none or um, never or accept. So these are the far ends or far ranges. Um, and, and a lot of times those will be very helpful in defining uh, an absolute context that will allow us to get a question right. So the purpose of an experiment, italicized words, floating numbers, causal statements, and extreme language. Those are all things that we want to highlight. So in addition to highlighting, another powerful tool that you've got at your disposal is your scratch paper. Now I know you, you probably don't think that's a powerful tool, but its power comes from how we choose to use it. When you're working questions, you're going to work questions from passage one and then passage two and passage three, and things are going to get kind of messy. But you want to keep things organized so that if you have some extra time at the end, it's very easy to go back in time and figure out where your work for question two of passage one was and question 10 of passage 3 was so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel and start over. So on that account, on your scratch paper, you want to write the following things every time. For each question, you want to write a passage number, and that way you remember what passage that question went with. You want to write the question range, meaning maybe passage 1 was questions 1 through 5, question two, or passage two was question six through nine, and so forth. And that way you know all of these questions went with one particular passage from your test. And then we're gonna talk about later how to identify the subject or the topic of the passage. And that's gonna be important because some of you are gonna find some topics easier than others. Some people are gonna love when they're dealing with a uniform circular motion passage, but they're going to hate it when they have an electricity passage. And then the fourth thing you want to write every time is the, the physics topic. So maybe the subject is MRI, 
but the physics topic is a magnetic field. And so if you can identify the topic, you can then very quickly think about what all the equations are that go with that topic. And that will determine how easy or hard that passage is for you, and therefore whether you're going to do it now or do it later. On your scratch paper, if they describe an experiment where a certain apparatus was built, or if they describe a situation which involves vectors, in addition to writing these things, you want to draw a diagram. And that diagram is going to put the numbers into context, or it's going to show you how a particular experiment is set up, so that if questions get asked about it, you're ready to refer to your diagram rather than referring to numbers in the text. And when we did ICC number nine earlier for our teach back, we saw a really good example of how to uh, take numbers and build a diagram out of them so that we could build a diagram out of them so that we could um, uh, access that information very quickly. Another thing that we might want to write on our scratch paper is equations that are pertinent. So I'm going to write equations that are relevant. Now what I mean by equations that are relevant is if it is in fact a magnetic field passage and we know the force equation for a magnetic field, we want to write it down so that if they ask you a question about forces from magnetic fields, we've got that equation. Also, if there's equations embedded within the passage, which is probably a little less likely on an experimental style passage where you've got graphs and tables, we want to write those equations down as well. That way they're immediately available at your disposal so that you can work them. Um, so these are all things you want to keep straight on your scratch paper because you're going to be fitting a lot in a fairly limited amount of space. So we've talked about highlighting. We've talked about your use of the scratch paper. Now the third thing that we should discuss are the question types. And how would those question types be, uh, or, or how would these question types show up on an experimental or data presentation style passage. A lot of these questions are going to be the kind that say, you know, if one thing gets changed, how would the data change? If one, uh, in, if one independent factor changes, how does the dependent factor change? So we know there's three question types. We've got it on our diagram up here, memory, explicit, implicit. Let's start by talking about the implicit question type as it relates to the experimental or data presentation uh, stock passage. So just as a reminder, um, Jim Bob, could you tell us what an implicit question is? Okay, that's right. An implicit question is one where you use outside knowledge plus information from the passage and it kind of bring things together and synthesize them. So for these experimental or data style passages, implicit questions will require you to interpret the data they give you based on some outside knowledge. So interpretation with outside knowledge. Interpretation with outside knowledge. So it, it's, in other words, taking the data that's on the page and going one step further and saying, this is what the experiment yielded, and how would you, um, how would you, or how would you expect the data to change if one significant factor was changed? Like maybe another force was added to the scenario. Um, how would that affect the data that was, was shown to you? The second kind of question is uh, maybe the easier type for many of us, and it's an explicit question. And explicit, as you see, can range 
or, or, or we said at the outset, is kind of where a lot of the experimental and data questions are going to fall. So with an explicit question, um, let's get a reminder of what that means. Okay, Sam, what does an explicit question mean? It means straight from the passage. So explicit questions are going to be very common with data passages because there's going to be graphs and there's going to be tables and you're going to have to look at them, analyze them, and maybe even extrapolate uh, and, and figure out what the next data point would be based on the data that is given. So with the explicit question, you're going to look at graphs and tables for the data presentation style passages and you're going to draw conclusions based on the data and then finally from our, our three quadrant diagram up here we know that the third kind of question is a memory question and memory questions can appear with data presentation questions but uh, memory questions are based totally on outside data uh, and so they might give you a floating number, for example, and then just expect you to use an equation. So memory questions would be totally based on outside knowledge. And so you might have a data point in the passage, and you're going to use exclusively outside knowledge to answer that question. So we know there's implicit explicit and memory style questions, but you want to know um, how those might show up in the context of an experimental or data presentation passage, and we'll work some passages together to get a feel for that later on in class today.